On today's episode of the CLS Experience, we have a very exclusive treat. He's a physician, adult, and child psychiatrist, and founder of Aiming Clinics, whose 11 locations across the U.S. have the largest database of brain scans across the globe. He's an 18-time national best-selling author, and he makes complex concepts appear very digestible and simple to practice. He's on a mission to end mental illness with his revolutionary brain health breakthroughs, and his relationship advice will penetrate your soul. No big deal. He's produced 17 national public television shows about the brain, and his online content has touched hundreds of millions of lives. His brain advice is second to none, and he's here to teach you actionable tips to help you heal your brain and upgrade your life. He's just a juggernaut in all facets of life and a terrific husband and father and grandfather. Please welcome the brilliant, wise, dynamic, and handsome, abundant Dr. Daniel Amen. How are you doing, Dr. Amen? Craig, thanks so much. Uh, thanks for helping me spread the message of brain health. You know, I hate the term mental illness. It's like, stop that. It's not mental, it's brain. Get your brain healthy your mind will be so much better. Yeah, and it's my pleasure. And for the audience listening, over 4 million now, my biggest suggestion, if you're not familiar with Dr. Amen, do a deep dive, read his books, check out his content, listen to his podcast. What I think is most valuable today is we just have an unbelievable conversation. But let's start right there. Because for most people who aren't familiar with the science and so forth, I imagine there's some people confused with the difference between mental illness, or I know you don't like to use that phrase, but also like brain health. Like what is the difference between mind stuff and the brain stuff? Your brain, the physical functioning of your brain creates your mind. And if your brain is not healthy, your mind suffers. And so the first step, see, I think psychiatry in general has it completely backwards in that you go see a psychiatrist, you say, I'm depressed. He gives you a diagnosis with the same name. He says, oh, you're depressed and gives you an antidepressant, which in large scale studies work no better than placebo. And it's like, well, wait a minute. If you're depressed, it's like, well, why are you depressed? Is it because you have a crisis in your life or is it because you had a brain injury? Is it because you live in a mold-filled environment? Is it because you got COVID and you got inflammation in your brain? So symptoms will tell you what it is. I can tell if somebody's depressed in like 10 minutes, but I can't tell you why. And at Amen Clinics, I have 11 clinics around the country. We look at the brain and it just created a revolution in my life. It's like, oh, this is a brain health issue. If I get your brain right, you tend to be happier. You tend to be calmer. You tend to be more focused. So it's really foundational. I think of it sort of like hardware and software. If the hardware is not working, programming the software won't fix it. Yeah, that's where we dropped the mic, but we're just getting warmed up. This is unbelievable. To be honest with you, I just learned so much from, from what you just said. I want to unpack a little bit. First thing was that, that's I imagine that's backed by research that you said that, that um, antidepressants don't work more effectively than placebo. Wow. I mean, that's groundbreaking right there. Yeah, no, there's a big 60 Minutes piece on this that when you take the published and unpublished research data, it's SSRIs, selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors, what people typically get started on, Prozac, Zoloft, Lexapro, in large-scale studies work no better than placebo. Now, it doesn't mean they don't work, but often people have to try four or five different ones to find what works for them. And oh, by the way, head to head against antidepressants, omega-3 fatty acids have been found to be equally effective. Head to head against antidepressants, exercise have been found to be equally effective. Head to head against antidepressants, learning how to not believe every stupid thing you think 
has been found to be equally effective. So if you're depressed, why not take fish oil exercise and get control over your mind and then see if you need them? But we have it backwards because in a seven minute office visit with your primary care doctor, you may leave with something for anxiety, something for depression and something for sleep. And I'm not okay with that. Same. I agree with you hundred percent. This is awesome. Straight up. Um, you're a stud. So there's that. You mentioned, and I don't want to dive too much into this, but you mentioned something along the lines of COVID caused inflammation on the brain. Is that true? Absolutely true. Wow. And if you get COVID, in the next six months, you have a 25% increased risk of being diagnosed with a new onset psychiatric problem, anxiety, depression, paranoia. And I, so at Amon Clinics, we do a study called SPECT. And SPECT looks at blood flow and activity. It looks at how your brain works. And we have scans before and after COVID. And it's like a little bomb goes off in your brain your emotional brain becomes inflamed and then that puts you at risk for mental health stuff wow this is fascinating and of course i want to dive into all stuff with the new book and so forth but i wanted to ask you this just straight off the cuff i grew up a big fan of professional wrestling i also love sports i've had a bunch of the nfl players and so forth on the podcast and there's a big thing in the nfl called cte which, correct me if I'm wrong, you know better than I do, is trauma on the brain and how it, people behave after that and so forth. What is your position on that? And also, is, is, it, is this true? It, is it backed by science at this point that all the trauma causes stuff on the brain and then makes you behave differently, such as maybe more moody or more sporadic? So it's absolutely true that traumatic brain injuries are a major cause of psychiatric problems. Absolutely true. Um, playing football is a brain damaging sport. We, we just need to stop lying about that. In 2007, I saw Anthony Davis, the Hall of Fame running back from USC, who also played in the NFL. And at 54, his brain looked like he was 94, oh my and goodness. bad for 94. But on a brain rehabilitation program, five months later, he's dramatically better. And if you knew Anthony, he's like, Doc, we have to talk about this. And um, it was at the time the NFL was actively in denial that they had a problem. In fact, in 2009, Roger Goodell was in front of Congress going, you know, we don't know if playing football causes brain damage. We're studying the issue. And Maxine Waters, a congresswoman from Los Angeles, whacks him and says, <laughs> Commissioner, having you act like you're studying traumatic brain injury in football is a conflict of interest. It's sort of like the tobacco companies saying they're studying cigarettes and lung cancer. And so in 2009, I partnered with the Los Angeles chapter of the NFL Players Association and did the first and largest study on active and retired NFL players. We published a study in 2011 on 100 players, high levels of damage. Stop lying about it. You play football, your brain is soft, your skull is hard, your skull has sharp bony ridges. Helmets protect you against skull fractures. They do not protect you against brain damage. And so own it. But after I started doing the study, my problem is, is I tend to love all my patients. And I'm like, well, I wonder if we can fix it. And so I developed a brain rehabilitation program and 80% of our players get better. Now, Wow, that's really exciting because that's really the take home answer of my work, sure. which is you are not stuck with the brain you have. You could make it better, even if you've been bad to it. And I can prove it now. CTE is a different animal and there's a lot of controversy around it. CTE stands for chronic traumatic encephalopathy. 
multiple hips, hits to the brain causes inflammation. And um, what, what a lot of people say, it's chronic, it's progressive, and it's untreatable. And I think that's complete crap. I think if you don't put the brain in a healing environment, then it's chronic and progressive. But let's not say it's untreatable unless you've done what I've done, which is treat these people and see them get dramatically better. Dick Buckus, the Hall of Fame linebacker sure. for the Bears, calls me his brain savior because he <laughs> takes his supplements. He's been in a hyperbaric chamber 800 times. And at 80 years old, he's sharp as he was when he was 60. How exciting is that? And the implications are way more than football. Um, Three million new people every year have a traumatic brain injury. So one, stop texting when you're driving or when you're walking, right? You have to protect yourself from traumatic brain injuries. Don't let your kids play tackle football. No, it's a brain damaging sport. They're going to be taking care of you when you're 90. Do you really not want them to have a good brain? Um, so, I mean, there's just so much out of my NFL work that was really instruct in, instructive. And one, I published a study on my group, overweight players versus healthy weight players. Overweight players had lower blood flow, especially to the front part of their brain. Things like focus and forethought and judgment and impulse control. So if you want a healthy brain, you got to be at a healthy weight. Right. Let's stay there for a second. So if lack of blood flow to your brain can make you perform less than stellar, what is a tangible thing that people can use to maybe increase blood flow to their brain? So kill the alcohol and marijuana. Permanently? Uh, yeah. O only as long as you want a healthy brain. I mean, I mean, and you know, it's a good time to talk about, well, how can you have any fun? And I would argue who has more fun, the person with the good brain or the person with the bad brain. Um, you know, so, I'm- so Just to be clear, not even like one drink on a Saturday night, does no good. The American Cancer Society last year came out against any alcohol because they said any alcohol is associated with an increased risk of seven different types of cancer. Wow. I believe, it's my prophecy, that 20 years from now, we're going to think of alcohol like cigarettes. Ooh. See somebody smoking. You're like, really? Yes. You don't know that's bad for you. And when you see somebody drinking, my prediction is, because all the research is pointing in the same direction as the American Cancer Society. It causes relationship problems. It causes judgment problems. It causes money problems, work problems, alcohol. It's just not your friend. And you got to ask yourself, why do you need to be messed up in order to have fun. So true. There's so many ways to decrease your anxiety. And uh, yeah, no, I'm not a fan. Just sort of like I'm not a fan of marijuana Same. because of the research that I've done on it and the problems that I see in teenagers and young adults. It's not a good thing for most people. Wow. This is really good to know. Um, and I agree with you and the way you illustrated that I could see years from now, people looking at alcohol, the way they do with cigarettes today. And it's true. Like, like, I think everybody knows that it doesn't really add any good. Um, so maybe you just start associating pleasure with being hundred percent sober. I have something really important to ask you. You ready for me? I am. Is it true? You're an avid ping pong player. I am. <laughs> I am. I have a table actually right to my right. I would like to challenge you to a game at some point next time. Maybe you're in Manhattan and your schedule permits. I love that. Okay. All right. Good. Um, I was looking at your content today as everybody, all the listeners should, 
everything Dr. Amy talks about is productive, uh, it's brilliant, and, and it makes a lasting impression. And one of the things I saw you talking about, and it's really interesting, is the concept of mourning anxiety. How many people deal with this? Why do they deal with it? And what is something we can do to maybe overcome it or at least keep it at bay? So it's very common. Um, probably 30% of the population wakes up and their brain is going to what's wrong. And part of it's an evolution adaptation that thousands of years ago, you needed to wake up in fear. You needed to wake up and go, okay, who's going to eat me today? But we don't need to do that anymore. It is not adaptive currently. And it causes you to suffer. Now, let's just take one quick step back and say the goal is not no anxiety. That's not the goal. So think of anxiety from zero to 10. So zero is none. 10 is debilitating anxiety. Uh, my goal for you is to live at about a three. It's people who have low levels of anxiety die early from accidents and preventable illnesses. You need in your head to go, I don't want to be fat because as my weight goes up, the size of my brain goes down. You need to like put your cell phone down, especially when you're walking or driving. You need to be able to predict bad things are going to happen if you don't make good decision. So the goal is not Bobby McFerrin's don't worry, be happy. That's early death. So you want some anxiety that it's like, come on, get up, get on the bike, do the right things. That'll help us live longer. Um, but too much clearly makes you suffer. And morning anxiety actually starts the night before. Really? So when I go to bed at night, I say a prayer and then I go, what went well today? And I go on a little treasure hunt, nudging my mind to look for what's right about my life way more than what's wrong about my life. And I've been doing this for 10 years and it's so helpful because I tend to wake up in the morning from the treasure hunt. That little treasure hunt at night sets your dreams up to be more positive. But if if you wake up with anxiety, do four, so it'll take you a minute, 15 second breaths and do it mostly with your belly. So it's called diaphragmatic breathing and four seconds in, one, two, three, four, hold it for a second and a half, eight seconds out. So taking twice as long to breathe out as you breathe in, triggers a parasympathetic or relaxation response in your body. And while you're breathing, what I want you to say to yourself is today is going to be a great day. And then your mind, if you discipline it, will begin to find, well, why is today going to be a great day? And it could be something as simple as dropping your kids off at school and giving them a hug. Or for me, I sit in the back of my backyard and watch hummingbirds for 10 months out of the year. I love that so much. So it doesn't have to be a big thing. It can just be, or I make my family brain healthy hot chocolate at night. And just that first sip makes me feel so happy. Um, training your mind is critical, but also breathing. Uh, especially taking twice as long to breathe out. This is so good. And, and I got to be honest with you, I would love some brain healthy hot chocolate right now. Um, we'll, we'll take a rain check. But also like, I couldn't help but notice, like when you were describing it, it's like getting momentum, right? So the night, before, you start your wind down routine the night before and, and you put yourself in that frequency of what was great today, that treasure hunt. And then you carry that momentum and then you wake up kind of in a similar frequency. And it's, Recently, I started because I think most people say they think about what can go wrong. I started making a really conscious effort when navigating life to think about what can go right. 
And it's not that I'm delusional about, you know, obstacles and adversity, but I just choose to focus on what can go right. And I notice that the more I do that, the more beautiful blessings come into my life. And so it reminded me of what you're saying by starting the night before to kind of get some momentum, right? So left undisciplined, your brain is likely to hurt you. And what I get frustrated with is there's nowhere in school where they teach you to master your mind. How insane is that? I was 28 years old and in my psychiatric residency at the Walter Reed Army Medical Center in Washington, DC, when one of my professors said to, the, to our group, you don't have to believe every stupid thing you think. And I'm like, whoa, I've always believed every stupid thing I thought, even though thoughts come from all sorts of places. They come from your ancestors, from the voices of your mother, your father, your friends, your foes, the news you watch or the music you listen to. And no one had ever taught me to challenge my own thoughts. You know, as a teenager, I was really good at challenging my parents, <laughs> but not good at all at, you know, if I had a jealous thought or an envious thought or a small thought or a belittling thought or a guilty thought, no one had ever taught me, you don't have to believe the noise your brain creates. And one of the strategies in my new book, Change Your Brain Every Day, is give your mind a name. Because if you gain psychological distance from the noise in your head, you don't have to attach to what it produces. You can just, so I gave my mind the name of my pet raccoon. When I was 16, I had a pet. <laughs> and raccoons have 200 different sounds. And she would stir up shit like she ate all the fish out of my sister's aquarium. It's a really <laughs> bad day for me. She teepeed my mother's bathroom. My mother threatened to leave my dad if he didn't get rid of the raccoon. That was a bad day. She would leave raccoon poo in my shoes. And, and I loved her, but she was a troublemaker. And that's my mind. That's so many people's minds. And so, you know, metaphorically, I'll put her in the cage or, you know, more recently, metaphorically, I'll just imagine her on her back and I'd pet her and tickle her and she loved that. And I'm like, come on, let this is not that serious. Compared to death and you're gonna die. None of this is that serious. No, this is dynamite. All of it, straight up. And, and first of all, I, I love the techniques with, with the pet raccoon and so forth. Um, and also, like, thoughts are not facts. And there's power in choosing a different thought. But I, I like the word that you used is challenge your thought. Then it can almost be a game. But at least it's a game that you know you're playing. Well, the goal is not positive thinking. The goal is accurate thinking. That's why I teach my patients, whenever you feel sad, mad, nervous, or out of control, write down what you're thinking. And I have nine different ant species. So ant stands for automatic negative thoughts, automatic negative thoughts. Well, there's nine of them. There's all or nothing thinking or blaming or mind reading or fortune telling or focusing on the bad. And so identify what kind of ant it is and then talk back to it. You, you don't have to believe every stupid thing you think. And I have this technique I actually stole from my friend, Byron Katie. Take the original thought that's bothering you, flip it to the opposite, and then ask yourself if the opposite isn't true. So for example, I get picked on a lot because I'm a bit of a lightning rod in my community in psychiatry. And <laughs> so I had this group that was picking on me recently. And, and 
it was a week ago, Monday. And I remember going, I hate this. I just hate it. And then, so I like do what I tell my patients because I believe authenticity is, is my first core value. Yes. And, and so I just wrote, I love it. And I'm like, well, is it true? I love the criticism. Well, I love being a revolutionary. I love going against the status quo because the status quo sucks. <laughs> and so if I have to put up with this, well, I love it. And then all the unhappiness just sort of melted away. It's like, I've been in this fight with my colleagues since 1995. And if you don't look at the brain, that's the whole issue. You know, psychiatrists are the only medical doctors who never look at the organ they treat. Well, you can't say that to 40,000 psychiatrists and they go, thank you. Thanks for pointing that out. They're like, no, you're crazy. You're a snake oil salesman. You're a charlatan. I'm like, no, I'm not selling snake oil. And I'm not a charlatan. I have the best outcomes of anybody in psychiatry. If you don't look, you don't know. Stop lying about it. So I, I love being in the fight. But you see how I could take, I hate this and feel victimized and sad, or I could turn it around and feel like a warrior. I mean, talk about a paradigm shift. I imagine most people's limiting belief, I could be wrong, but I think I heard you talk about this too, is that I am not enough or I am unworthy. I, I imagine you see that often too. So doing this same exercise, you would challenge that by saying, I am more than enough. I am worthy. Or I am enough. I, I've seen some of the most successful people in the world. Um, and they all have the same thought of I'm not enough. And I, I look at them and it's like, dude, if you're not enough, nobody's ever going to be. <laughs> um, but let's focus on I am enough. Where do you see that that is true? So take the thought that's bothering you, flip it to the opposite and go, is that true? And it's it's a fun exercise. And the goal is not positive thinking. It's just accurate thinking. So good. So in this case, I am enough. And then you'd say, is that true? And the answer is yes. Well, and you can probably find one example where you're enough. And if you can find one, you can find two. And if you find two, you probably can find four. And then pretty soon, I'm not enough just sort of goes away. Yeah. But talk back to yourself. If you weren't good at doing it with your parents, um, be good at doing it with yourself. Fair enough. Love this so much. Uh, there's a pretty cool, sexy looking book right behind you right now. It says change your brain every day. You've written an abundant, a plethora of books. Uh, you're super successful. You're a trailblazer. Why this book and why now? But, you know, during the pandemic, I realized mental health, brain health, it's a daily practice, just like physical health. You can't do it once and expect to be okay. It's like you can't be 50 pounds overweight on Monday, have a salad and expect to be trim on Friday. No, no, no. It's a daily practice, just like spiritual health. You know, it should be a Sunday thing. It should be a daily practice. Yes. So I remember March 10th, 2020, my book, The End of Mental Illness, had just come out. And I got a call. I was supposed to be in New York, in Manhattan, uh, on the Mel Robbins show. I'd scan Mel. We were going to show her scan on TV. And I got a call from the producer who said, don't come, we're closing New York. And I'm like, oh my God. And I remembered that night writing down, um, mental hygiene is just as important as washing your hands. And I predicted the mental health pandemic, which we subsequently had, lock people down, they're gonna get crazy. Wow. Uh, it's like, but you don't have to that there are daily practices you can do. So this book, and 
I almost hate to say it because I love all my books, but this is my favorite book because <laughs> ultimately it's all of the best things I've said over the last 40 years. So it's sort of like my greatest hits, 366 short essays, 366 rather than 365 because next year is leap year. So 366 short essays on the most important things I've ever said. And every day is a little daily practice in brain and mental health oh this is so good and it's one of those books where like you don't have to necessarily read it straight through i i suggest everybody do but you could pick it up again and just go to a different essay or a different chapter anytime right absolutely pick what works for you but so many people love it one of my um patients public knowledge amber childers the beautiful actress uh she read the part on how to break a panic attack and later that day her daughter had a panic attack she walked her through how to get rid of it her daughter did great and that's why this book exists to yeah. help you help yourself and help the people you care about that's what I want to acknowledge you for that. One of the many things that you do so well that I really personally gravitated towards your content and really helped me is that when you talk about this stuff, you break it down and make it very applicable and tangible and digestible so that anybody listening or reading can then take it and apply it immediately. And I want to acknowledge you for that. Some of it's a little complex, but you make it you know sound so simple. Yeah, it's written at a sixth grade level because I never want words to slow people down. So I'm always thinking how to make this easy, simple. And ultimately, there are dozens of tiny habits in the book. And my favorite tiny habit is what I call Chloe's game. So when my daughter, Chloe, who's 19, was two, we used to play this game called Chloe's game. And I would go, is this good for your brain or bad for it? And, you know, she's two years old and I would go blueberries and she'd go God's candy. Or I would say avocado, she'd go God's butter or plain football. Oh, very bad. And if you can, in a simple gamified way, put that in their heads, just helps them for the rest of their life. But that's the question. Ultimately, you want to ask yourself. So we talked about alcohol, we talked about marijuana, and we talked about exercise, you know, just is it good for my brain or bad for it? And stop, I always call these the babies in brain health going, but how can you have any fun? And it's like, well, who has more fun, the person with the good brain or the person with the bad brain? You're probably like me. And you know what you want. Like, I want energy. Yes. I want focus. I want memory. I want clarity. I want good decisions. I want passion. I want to make a difference. And alcohol doesn't fit with any of those things that I want. So it's not, oh, I can't have this. You know, I want what I want when I want it. That's a four year old's mindset. It's no. Does this behavior fit my goals? And if it doesn't, I'm sort of an idiot if I engage in them. Yeah, because then you'd be inauthentic if you want this, but you're you're choosing to do that and it's kind of productive. Love this. A couple of things you mentioned right there. It's interesting because the pandemic slash lockdown, you know, now we're we're dealing with a lot of the the consequences in regards to inflation and stuff like that. But I don't think enough people are talking about the consequences for our health, our mindset, our mental health, staying mentally fit. And you called it right from the beginning because just staying alone or indoors for that long, I, I think you know better than I like the suicide rates up and, and all that type of stuff. And what, how do, how do we come together and, fix this or, or at least stop it before it gets out of hand. It's kind of already out of hand. It's totally out of hand. And if you take the pandemic and mix it with the political divide and then the oh. societal unrest, um, it's just a prescription for trouble. 
but it's also a great opportunity. There are a whole group of people during the pandemic where they got closer with their children. You know, I mean, it was a historic opportunity. Uh, we had to have two teenage girls. And before the pandemic, we like never saw them. They were like every night of the week, they were out with their friends, they were doing things and they were being just sort of normal kids. And then everybody's locked down and they hate it. But my wife and I love it because we had just this unprecedented bonding time. You know, like everybody's making dinner together. Everybody's taking an hour and a half to eat and they're cleaning up afterwards. And I remember about halfway through feeling sad because I'm like, this is going to end and that's going to suck. And it really, whatever situation you're in, are you taking advantage of it or are you a victim mm. of it? And I, I think we just have to help people develop the daily practices to get control of their brain, their mind, their relationships and their life. It's so interesting because for me, it was a historic opportunity that I took advantage of by reinventing myself. But first I looked around and I observed and I just saw everybody, most people, a lot of Netflix, specifically that Tiger show, a lot of day drinking. And I just said, you know, my thought process with these people are missing a great opportunity. When will the world ever sit still like this? And it's interesting that you had similar, but just bonding with your family and take advantage of those moments as well such an opportunity and but it's you know crisis is uh in chinese it's a combination of two symbols danger and opportunity and in the pandemic there was plenty of danger but there was also plenty of opportunity and yes there there are consequences but that also means there's a huge need to be of service that a lot of people need you now more than ever before. And it's where you let your mind go. Can, am I a victim of what happened? And I'm pretty pissed off about what happened and how the government handled this. I'm really unhappy about that. And so I could stay in being pissed off or I could go, all right, what's the opportunity? And I prayed the serenity prayer. God grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change, the courage to change the things I can, and the wisdom to know the difference. Every day during the pandemic, I prayed that multiple times a day. What can I do? And what can't I do? So even though I was not a huge fan of the masks well that was not a fight i was gonna engage in right the government of california said you gotta wear them if you're in a healthcare facility so i'm not fighting that fight but yeah. i'm also taking vitamin d and getting in the sun to strengthen my immune system yeah beautifully said danger and opportunity two sides of a coin uh before we land the plane of course i have to ask you this uh, two things. Number one, how long in, in, have you and your wife been married? 15 years. You guys are clearly doing something right. Uh, what are some keys to a successful relationship? Well, the first thing is you have to tell your brain what you want. And so the front part of your brain is the executive part of the brain, sort of like the boss at work. And both of us are very clear. We want a kind caring, loving, supportive, passionate relationship. Always want that. Don't always feel like that. I get these rude thoughts in my head. And if I'm smart, and I am most of the time, I filter the rude comment with, is this going to help get you a kind, caring, loving, supportive, passionate relationship? So I keep my mouth shut quite a bit. Um, and it works so well. And we put God and the brain as foundational elements of our relationship. So we don't do things that are against our values or that hurt our brain. You know, as a psychiatrist for 40 some years, 
I see so many problems because of alcohol or drugs that people just wouldn't act that way if their brain was functioning right. Um, and we work together. We've done almost a thousand podcasts together. And it just takes communicating. And we're really good if somebody does something the other one doesn't like. We talk about it, but we talk about it in a way knowing each other wants a good relationship, wants this to be our forever relationship. So good. And one thing that I've learned from having contrast with toxic relationships that didn't work out and the one I'm in now, which I believe is my soulmate, is maybe it's overlooked a little bit, but respect, right? Like you don't always have to agree with the other person's opinion, but there's got to be a level of respect there. Would you agree with that? Yes. And that would go with kindness. And at work, I have the no asshole rule. There's actually a book by Robert Sutton <laughs> called the no asshole rule. And I love it. I completely own that. It's, you know, I, I won't work with people who are assholes. And quite frankly, I'm not going to have them in my life. Mm -hmm. But the no asshole rule starts with me. I cannot be an asshole. And I think that is tremendously helpful um, as well. I have a mnemonic in the book on relationships and it's relating. Uh, I want to be 100% responsible for my part in this relationship. I never want to go 50-50. No, it should be 100-100. I'm all in. And if we're struggling, I'm like, what is it I can do today to make this better? What is it I can do to make this better? E is empathy, seeing things from her point of view. L is listening to many people, especially in our society, are horrible at listening. They're, they already have the answer before the other person started talking. No, no, no. A is assertiveness. When we're unhappy, we talk about it. Um, T is time, absolutely essential. And during the pandemic, people got a lot more time together. And for some people, that was really awesome. Some people, that was really awful. Yeah. I is inquire into the negative thoughts you have. Don't believe every stupid thing you think. N is probably the most important. Notice what you like more than what you don't. And G is grace and forgiveness. And um, they're just foundational principles to have good relationships. So good. Dr. Amen, is fitness a big part of your life besides ping pong? Well, I was on the bike this morning and I lifted Bye. weights and did high intensity interval training. It's critical, right? I mean, I'm going to be 69 in a couple of months. 69 and, years young. And I've seen way too many 69 year old brains to not be afraid. <laughs> and um, it's blood flow. Low blood flow is the number one brain imaging predictor of Alzheimer's disease. And, and I feel every bit as sharp now as when I was 30, but a lot happier than when I was 30. Yeah, so good. Uh, two final short nuggets for the audience. I know they'll get a lot out of this. What are a couple foods that the audience can start adding to their nutrition immediately to help boost mood? Well, add this thought about foods. Only eat foods you love that love you back. So both you and I have been in bad relationships in the past. And I'm not doing that anymore. Same. And it doesn't sound like you're doing that either. <laughs> Why would you ever do it with food? People go, but I love pizza. Or I love ice cream. Or I love chili cheese fries. Um, those clearly are not good for you. So Drew Carey said it best. He said, eating crappy food isn't a reward. It's a punishment. So if you get your mindset right, then like colorful berries, awesome for your brain. Healthy fats, healthy oils, avocado oil, coconut oil, olive oil, um, olives. I'm a huge fan of olives, salmon. Um, other fatty fish, sardines, mackerels, 
um, great for the brain. Nuts and seeds, especially macadamia nuts. People go, oh, but they have so much fat. Your brain is 60% fat. If somebody calls you a fathead, say thank you. <laughs> I love that. And the final nugget, um, what I'm genuinely just curious about this. What is one thing I can do or the audience can do to improve memory? You got to work it. It's just like a muscle. The more you rely on your phone for your memory, the less um, strong it will be for you. And um, when you think of working out your brain, it's more than word games. Word games is working the left front side of your brain. It's just sort of like if that's all you do to keep your brain young, crossword puzzles. It's like going to the gym, doing right bicep curls, and then leaving. <laughs> it's like you want to work out your frontal lobes. So strategy games are awesome. But you also want to work out your parietal lobe. So there's something like basketball, golf, juggling can be helpful. Um, creative design, learning a language, uh, pickleball, uh, or table tennis, because that works out lots of different areas of your brain. So good. I recently just started boxing because, you know, I run marathons and I lift weights, but I wanted to try something new. There's just something so exhilarating and fun about being a beginner again and being challenged and, and just wanting to get better and so forth. And I imagine that that feeling, I don't know if it's dopamine or what, but just, but just I'm working out my brain because it's new and it's technique and I'm trying to get better. Is that right? Yeah, but don't let anybody hit you in the head, even with the helmet on. It's not a good thing. I have four world heavyweight uh, boxers. I have their scans, Muhammad Ali and Mike Tyson. I was actually just with Mike Tyson. Saw that. Um, and boxing is clearly not good for your brain. In fact, the caption with the picture is, Mike damages brains, I repair them. Yeah. <laughs> well, I don't think I'm going to be turning pro in that sport. More for just a, a switch of pace and a workout. But But I'm glad I asked you for sure. I think I have the answer to this question, but with the audience blowing up and, and they're so loyal and engaging, what's the best way for everybody to support you, Dr. Eamon? Oh, I would love if they'd help us with the revolution. Um, so just following and sharing is the most important thing. Uh, Change Your Brain Every Day comes out March 21st. If people pre-order the book, they... Have, we have four free gifts for them. Go to changeyourbraineveryday.com um, or follow us on Instagram at doc underscore Amen um, or on TikTok, Doc Amen. Um, or if they're struggling and want to come to one of the clinics, amenclinics.com. And, and this just hit me, maybe we could do a giveaway. The best takeaway from this episode, shoot me a message on, on social media. And the number one, uh, we'll decide and Dr. Amon will send a signed copy of one of his books. Fair enough? Awesome. How can I personally support you? Well, I think you just have. And I'm just so grateful for you helping me spread this message and doing a great interview. Thank you so much. Absolutely. The world needs it. Hang up for one sec. I just want to connect with you after. Dr. Amon, I want you to know you the definition of perspective, authenticity, and wisdom from taking your life experience to spreading positivity, light, and deep truths. I could personally guarantee that your best is yet to come. Keep on spreading your wings and leaving your mark on this world. So much love and respect for you. Thank you so much for stopping by and dropping these priceless, juicy nuggets today. It was so much fun. Thank you, Dr. Amon. You're welcome, Craig. That was a lot of fun. When are you coming to New York? Anytime soon? And I don't have any plans. I may be there the week of the book launch. We'll see. In March? What the marketing people drum up for me. Okay. Okay, cool. Um, let, let's stay connected. Are you on Instagram or you have a team that does it for you? Um, I have a team, but often if there's a DM or something, they send it to me. Okay. I'm going to shoot you a message. Awesome. Yeah. Thank you so much. Have a great rest of the day. And I'm looking forward to building a friendship and stay connected. Anything I could do to support. Great. Thanks, Craig. Bye, Dr. Amy. Bye now.